We are, we are calling to order meeting 267 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on May 6, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices here at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. We will begin today with item two, our administrative update. Uh, Executive Director Bedrosian, please. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my update will be quick, but what you see reflected in the agenda today, I think as I tried to describe last week, is the culmination of parallel paths getting ready for the opening of Encore, Boston Harbor, um, but there was only so much staff could do. Um, there were items that de uh, demanded, the, uh, demanded, required the Commission's attention, and I think you'll see the introduction of those items today. So thank you for your flexibility in taking these up so quickly. And um, I will just uh, remind the Commission that during uh, May and June, we may be required to have um, what I might call out of cycle or even shorter meetings to get some of these things ultimately addressed. So thank you very much. With that, I will turn it back over to our CFO for continuation of the discussion we had uh, the last meeting at which we had neglected to uh, schedule for a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good, Good morning. morning. On May 1st, Agnes and I presented to you the third quarterly budget update, which recommended adjusting the gaming control fund to $37.8 million, which is a $1.3 million increase all in legal costs. We're not recommending or asking for an increase to the assessment, as the majority of the increased costs are eligible for reimbursement from the Wynn Resort's ongoing suitability re review. Any amounts that are not reimbursable will be offset by the licensing fees that continue to outpace estimates. Um, the information in the packet is the same information we presented uh, on May 1st. If you have any additional questions, we'd like to take them up now. If not, we, we're seeking a vote. We, we addressed this, of course, at our last meeting. Um, we wanted to make sure it was properly marked up for the vote. We have that now, but do we need any further discussion or any questions answered by Derek or Agnes? Good morning, Agnes. No, I think it's an appropriate recommendation. Um, I think it also reflects the, um, the good budgeting that the team does here to try to forecast uh, rev both revenues and, and expenses um, with the exception of all the um, legal costs associated with the investigation, mm -hmm. which is what it is. We recover them from the licensee. Mm -hmm. Do we have a motion? <coughs> Um, uh, Madam Chair, I will move that the Commission approve uh, the adjustment to the budget as outlined in the packet um, and discussed uh, here today. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank Derek you. And thank you, Agnes. Good morning. Moving on to item three. <coughs> Mr. Ziamba and Mr. Uh, Delaney, Ombudsman John uh, Ziamba and Joe Delaney, our Construction Project Oversight Manager. Good morning. Good morning. John, how many notebooks do you have? I know, I know. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as you're aware, the Commission and Commission staff have been carefully monitoring the construction of the Encore Boston Harbor facility. In anticipation of the planned June 23rd opening, there are a number of items that are up for consideration by the Commission. First, Jackie Crum, Encore Boston Harbor Vice President and General Counsel, and Peter Campo, Director of Construction, will present an update on the project and answer any questions the Commission may have regarding the, their quarterly reports for the first quarter of 2018 and first quarter of 2019. After the quarterly reports, with the assistance of Joe Delaney, uh, construction uh, project manager, um, we will discuss a number of other updates and requirements. 
will ask for the Commission's approval of STV Incorporated as the firm to conduct the baseline monitoring and after opening transportation monitoring specified in the Commission's requirements, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation's requirements, and those of the City of Boston. As you're aware, monitoring the potential impacts from the facility has been and continues to be extremely important to the Commission. We will also hear a presentation regarding material changes to the project since the time of the Commission's approval of the final design of the project. As detailed in the memorandum in your packet and as described by Joe, the Commission has had a very thorough process to review the design of the Encore Boston Harbor facility. The Commission will also hear a presentation regarding the timeline for the remaining items to be constructed before the planned opening. Both the project changes and the timeline will be up for a vote by the Commission at a future Commission meeting. Following the timeline presentation, the Commission will hear a description of a proposed update to the Commission's current Section 61 findings, which uh, update memorializes the measures required by the Commission to avoid or minimize the project's impact on the environment. We recommend that the Commission request comments on the proposed amendment to the findings before taking action. Joe will discuss the potential timing of such request for comments. In general, the proposed update is designed to reflect the latest on the project's permitting and is designed to reference requirements of the project that were made subsequent to the Commission's issuance of its Section 61 findings. For example, uh, the document references changes that were made following the project's 2017 Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act notice of project change that was previously presented to the Commission. In the draft document, there is a rather lengthy description of the sediment remediation measures that were chosen at the time for a portion of the project site in an adjacent area of the Mystic River. The language of the proposed Section 61 findings will also provide an updated description of the work of the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group. The language in the current Section 61 findings was written before the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group's final deliberations and Boston's decision regarding its long-term Sullivan Square Rutherford Ave project. Encore Boston Harbor will provide and has provided significant funding for such project and is required to pay a proportionate share of such project under the current and the proposed Section 61 findings. New language is included to reflect current plans for Encore Boston Harbor's water shuttles. Included in your packets is also a memo we asked Encore Boston Harbor to provide that describes how it plans to meet the passenger levels included in the MEPA filings, despite the fact that the passenger capacity of individual water shuttles is less than anticipated. Mina Macarios from Anderson and Krieger is also here to help with the discussion of the findings. Follow that, we will have a presentation on Encore Boston Harbor's opening period traffic and public safety planning. And with that, I will turn it over to Jackie uh, and to Peter, uh, if you could join us up. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners, and thank you so much for having us here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we'll start with our quarterly report for, uh, it's actually uh, two quarters. It's the last quarter of 2018 and the first quarter of 2019. So I'm going to turn it over to our Director of Con uh, Construction, Peter Campo, to take you through the uh, construction update. Good morning. Good morning. We have approximately 35 days to temporary CFO. Uh, we expect to receive that no later than June 10th, and I'm pleased to report that we're on schedule. Um, we're in the final throes of finishing spaces throughout the facility, and I'll, I'll run through that on a space-by-space -space basis as we look at this presentation. These photos are a couple weeks old of the site, and uh, if you visit, you'd see that we're actually quite, quite a bit farther along than what you see here, even though what's, what you see is pretty, very substantial. Uh, the site work due to the winter weather, and I wish the rain would stop, um, is 
um, on schedule, but it's one of the items that's you know going to finish up right to the very end. But we don't see any problem. The paving is scheduled to uh, finish. Paving is scheduled for next week, and the turf areas, uh, all the gray areas you see in these photos, are turf, and that will be installed next week also. So you're going to see like a big. It's almost like the switch is going to turn. Uh, it's going to look fit fantastic out there. There really are no major issues on the site. Um, we planted over 700 large trees, just to give you an idea. We replaced a lot of the ones that didn't survive the winter, a normal uh, tough winter. Um, so those are in the process of being replaced, and we expect to have all those replaced in time for the opening. The uh, marine uh, docks are also 100% complete, minor punch list, and we're ready to start uh, testing shuttles uh, mid-May. more yeah and then the garage is a hundred percent complete we were storing materials on the b1 level and essentially we're just finishing that up the bottom three levels have been punch listed out a hundred percent done and we expect to have the b1 level done in the next couple of weeks so we don't see any issue with the garage either uh, the podium as you know the north uh, we ex uh, turned over the north section we've been using that since December which has been include the major plan, so that's been a huge benefit. And go to the next. The gaming areas, if not, I think all of the slot machines are on the floor now, and I think almost all of them are installed. And we're also installing gaming tables throughout. So when you walk through the space right now, it looks it really looks like a casino, which is kind of neat. Um, the convention areas are being punch listed, and we're just base. It's essentially done. Um, and again, you walk through there, beautiful space that's ready for opening right now. Another uh, slot. The tower, we've installed furniture all the way up through 27. We had a few lights of glass we had to replace. I think we've got less than a dozen left. And there's no, essentially just punch list and just finishing it up. But it look, again, it's in really, really good shape. The, uh, I do want to note that we have fallen behind in some of the punch lists. You've heard me say that word that, you know, punch lists in a facility of this size is pretty overwhelming. We've fallen a little bit behind in the atrium, the spa, and the gaming areas, but we're working with the construction manager and we expect to catch that up over the next two to three weeks. We're ba what we're essentially trying to do is have it 100% complete by June 1st. That allows operations uh, team enough time to move in and be ready for opening. The other thing that I should note is all the restaurant areas, half the restaurants have been accepted by the health inspector. Almost the, all the rest of them, uh, except for two, will be inspected this week. And then we expect to catch the other two up the end of the month. As well as the retail spaces um, in the promenade are all on schedule to be finished at the end of the month. So overall, we're in, uh, and I should note too that we're testing permanent, we tested permanent power this weekend. National Grid's doing a great job working with us, and we expect to have the permanent power accepted and approved this week, which is a big, another huge milestone. Um, so if you, uh, right now we're testing a lot of the fire alarm systems, that type of thing, but we're essentially on schedule, and we expect to be in very good shape by the 1st of June. It leaves us two to three weeks before opening. Uh, unless you have any further questions from Peter on the construction, uh, we can move to the off-site infrastructure improvements. I, I actually may have a couple, and, and maybe you were going to get into these later or, 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 um, or not. I'll just ask that. Um, just coming from the experience of MGM, there were a couple of areas, retail, uh, uh, et cetera, that were not open during at, at the very beginning, um, or they were uh, flexible space that was later going to be determined which uh, which was going to be its, its final use. Are there any areas uh, as such uh, that you're contemplating for uh, for the property? No, we expect to have all this ev everything 100% complete. The retail spaces uh, we did release late, so they're going to finish up right up the end of the month. And uh, we have a space for watches of Switzerland in the main lobby, which we released about two months ago, and uh, they're going to complete the first week of June. So we expect to have all that space complete on time. Great. And um, so what would you say is, in general, your critical path? Um, it's just all the testing, acceptance. We've got a portion of the elevators have been accepted. 
We've got approximately 20 more elevators to go that need to be inspected and signed off by the state. Uh, we, um, a good portion of those get done this week, including escalators. But we just have a lot of testing and that type of thing that's part of the whole turnover process that we need to pull together this month. Uh, one of the items which which we'll tell you a little bit more later, uh, we are trying to install a battery installation, uh, and that is delayed. That won't be part of the opening, but it, it wasn't anticipated as part of the initial project. It's an add-on, which um, we were hoping we can hopefully go to the next level of LEED certification. Um, but we've run into some issues in terms of the placement, and uh, so we need to look at alternative placement areas for that. Thank you. Okay. So as John alluded to, we, we have uh, significant off-stride infrastructure improvements. Uh, this is just a generalized map. We broke them into four different packages. And uh, because Wellington and Suites of Circle are relatively close in proximity, uh, we put that into one package. And then the other three packages are as outlined on the slide. Starting off with the first package, which is Lower Broadway, so that's the area right outside the, uh, the resort. We uh, are paving some nights this week, depending on the weather. Uh, the weather was not kind to us, as we all know, in April, so we're a little bit behind on that, but hopefully we can uh, catch up quickly. The landscaping will be done at the end of next week, and we are striping last week of May and testing on signals last week of May, first week of June. Uh, that includes the interconnect, which is the feed to the city of Boston, who's going to be monitoring that so that we can adjust for uh, special events or, or uh, times of significant traffic congestion. On CP2, which is Route 16, uh, this is the Wellington Circle and the Sweetser Circle uh, projects. We are paving Wellington starting this week. Marking and striping will be the week of uh, May 13th. And on Sweetser, we're waiting for MassDOT to finish some of their final bridge work, which has delayed us slightly. But uh, we, we, we should still be able to pave the week of 513. Markings will follow the next week. And uh, we've also agreed with the city of Everett to uh, some additional new curbing. And we're almost complete with that. We've got about another 75 feet of additional curbing to put in. On CP3, which is Molden and Wellington MBT MBTA stations, we are complete. Uh, just waiting for sign-off from MassDOT and the T, and we understand that that should be forthcoming uh, imminently. And then, of course, on Sullivan Square, we are paving. Uh, we are doing the final paving tonight. We start work on the traffic signals the week of uh, traffic signals on 514. Striping will be next week, and uh, with the landscaping, we're clearing this week, and we'll start next week, and I'm told it should be just a few days to get the landscaping installed. Scheduled uh, on that work to be done on the 24th. So moving forward to um, our diversity goals. As Jackie, you know, go ahead. Before you do that, um, I recall uh, there was uh, some paving and work that had to be done around Robin and Dexter, uh, that you were uh, waiting for some of the work uh, from... Um, Eversource. Eversource, yes. Yes. So that's, that, that, that worked out, and uh -huh. um, we are able to complete that paving as part of the Lower Broadway package. OK. Yeah. Thanks. OK. So obviously, our design phase is complete at this point, and uh, we're proud to say that we had a goal of 18.9%, and we uh, achieved 22.6% in our total MWVBE contracts. Uh, as you can see from this, the only one that we fell slightly short of was on the women business enterprises. Uh, we worked incredibly hard to try to bring that number to our goal, but, but we didn't achieve that number. On the contract, and just that's with respect to design only. That's correct. So, so we broke it out separately between design and construction contracts. Right. OK, thank you. Uh, and, and just to note, a lot of the design that we do is uh, internally done. And so mm -hmm. that, that was part of the, the That's issue. That's in interesting to me, because I know that with respect to design, 
WBEs have done quite well in Massachusetts generally, so that's good. A lot of that work was internal. Right. Okay. We have, and I'll defer to Peter, how many people on the design team internally? Oh, probably 60. That's here. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and more in Vegas as well. So it's a, it's okay. a big team. But otherwise, with respect to MBEs, um, you exceeded your goal with respect to that to more than exceeded. More. And how many, um, so four separate BB, uh, veteran um, awards. That's correct. And, and with the veteran um, business enterprises, what was difficult is a lot of veteran business ent enterprises don't necessarily identify as such. So they had to go through the registration that's process, right. certification right. process in order to be identified. And, and that's great for the future. Thank you. So on the, uh, whoops, I skipped ahead. On the uh, uh, contracts awarded for the construction phase, uh, we met and exceeded uh, all of the goals. And uh, if you look at the total number of contracts, our goal was 11.4 and we had 19.1. Uh, so this took a, a, an excessive amount of <laughs> effort from our team and from our uh, construction manager. And so um, we're very proud of that work. It's worthy of noting the number of contracts here. Of course, the, the project is quite large, but um, full parking, about 280 contracts. Well, what we did was right from the beginning, we broke down the packages into smaller packages, noting that um, other businesses, which <coughs> normally would not have the opportunity to participate in a, in a project this size, would have the opportunity to bid and compete. Mm -hmm. We also encouraged um, them to get together with other businesses so that they could grow for uh, future projects. And, and so you're saying as a, a joint, in a joint venture as opposed to, or, all, or subcontract? Uh, some were subcontractors and some were more joint ventures. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah great. And then on the workforce participation, so as you can see on this one too, we were fortunate enough to exceed all of our goals. I think what we're most proud of is the uh, minority participation, which we had a goal of 15% and we hit 25.3%. On women, uh, we were, had a goal of 6.9% and we hit 7.2%. Uh, this too was a pretty big struggle. And right to the very end, we were noticing that the women, uh, the women construction workers were dropping down. So we called a meeting, I say we, Peter called a meeting, <laughs> and looked at why that was happening. And what was happening is as we were cutting back the various trades because we were fa phasing out of that particular line of work, the first people that they were laying off were the women. So we made a conscious effort to say you have to keep them on. And so we were able to keep our numbers up at the end. Did, did you ask why that was? So I think it was the more junior, frankly, okay. members. Of Seniority the issue? Yeah, yeah. And so they, they you know, like to have their most senior people work on on work on this, and so it was uh, it was a directive that we gave that they actually had to keep them on longer. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note that the the minority and the female goal were almost prescribed in the in the gaming statute, but throughout, and this extends to MGM as well. It was great to see that both of you prescribed this as the floor, and not the ceiling. And I know early on we had a lot of encouragement to get you to raise the goal um, right. to kind of reflect the diversity of the region but you know to come in almost 10 percentage points above what the goal is is uh, is commendable thank you so just a quick update i know peter alluded to this briefly but the uh, installation of gaming equipment should be completed by the end of may we have uh, 3,109 of the 3,130 slot machines already installed. We have all non-poker tables installed, and we're working on the poker table installation as we speak. Um, in terms of hiring, at the time we prepared this, uh, late last week, we had 930 employees on board. Uh, this week, we're up to uh, 1,150. So we're bringing in people very quickly at this, at this point. And the number for you see 86% 80, of total hires in the onboarding process. That means they're going through either registration with the Gaming Commission or our own internal background check and onboarding. Uh, we're actually at 90%, so we've hired 5,200 of the uh, 5,800 employees. Has, has that process gone smoothly? Any, any snags that 
Your staff has been fantastic. Um, they have really got people through the registration process quickly and efficiently. Um, it's, it's always a challenge, I think, particularly when you're bringing, particularly now when we're bringing on boards of people, so we're working through that right now, but generally it's gone really smoothly. Will you be updating on the numbers uh, relative to um, on, on, on those people being hired, the, the number of women or local? Oh, absolutely. So yep. we're preparing that. It's a little bit difficult right now because we don't have completely accurate information about the people who are in the system. Okay. So that's the vast majority. Um, you know, we only have the 1,150 right now, but as soon as we get more people through the system, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll provide you that information. That's great. And also, um, and before you move on, Jackie, there's, um, you mentioned there's um, all, all of the slot machines are installed, but we are behind them, right, Ed, uh, in terms of testing. Can you speak a little bit to that? or? Yeah, yeah, I think our folks said they're in good shape, and the goal was to have them all tested and communicating with our CMS by the end of the month. Thanks. And so we hope to be completely done with hiring by the end of May. And then the idea would be to get everyone on board and start doing mass orientations and trainings uh, that will take uh, all the way up until opening. Mm -hmm. Just a few slides on uh, some other projects, even though we've been incredibly busy. Um, we've had amazing volunteerism from our, uh, from our teams. I think we've had, I think the number I received this morning was we've had over 700 hours um, volunteered this year to date. So a couple of projects that we worked on, we uh, made blankets for the Everett Grace Food Pantry. <coughs> we, uh, 30 volunteers helped Summer Search, which is a uh, program that seeks students out with potential but uh, unequal opportunities. And, and we partnered with them to ensure their success in school, work, and life. And so one of the components of that is a summer camp. So these are um, preparing bags for them to take to their summer camp experience. On one Boston day, we actually had a different project planned, um, but of course it poured on that day, so we were going to clean up a park, but that didn't work out so well. So we, we did that last week, but on one Boston day, we uh, entertained uh, over 100 children uh, for Kids Only, which is an after-school program, which is a uh, very high-quality out-of-school programming for school-aged children. Uh, the Walk for Change was last weekend, and we had over 60 employees and uh, friends of those employees participate in the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center Walk for Change. And then one of the partnerships that we have is with the Wang Theater, and we've been fortunate enough where uh, we've contracted for a certain amount of tickets every, um, every year, but they always give us extra if they have them. And so we were able to bring uh, children who would never necessarily have access to uh, some of these uh, to some of these programs uh, to the theater. They really do a good job in terms of bringing them in early, giving them food, and letting them speak to the uh, cast. And so it's been a fun uh, a fun way to uh, bring in some of the local um, groups that we work with. And finally, as uh, you know, we partnered with the uh, Museum of Fine Arts. We were sponsoring, and I hope I don't mess up Toulouse for track <laughs> the, the name of the exhibition. Um, all of the Everett residents and all of our employees get free admission for, to the MFA for the duration of the, um, of the uh, exhibition, which we're told is they're actually using. And that is it for our affirmative presentation, but we are, of course, available for any questions. Looks, um, it looks impressive, all the programs um, that your team, you know, got involved with, all the community programs. That really looks like uh, really good work being done, so congrats on that. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like there's quite a bit of progress since we last heard from you and uh, a lot more since we last visited. Um, Definitely a lot more a since lot you more last visited. Since, uh, it's been a while, so I, I really look forward to um, looking the, at the progress in uh, yeah. real time. We look forward to having you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to the next section, the independent traffic monitoring. 
section. I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, thank you, Ms. Crum. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm joined here by uh, Jim Folk, who's the Executive Director of Transportation for Encore Boston Harbor, as well as uh, Paul Tyrell and Dustin Kirksick from STV Incorporated. Um, so the first item we have here is the approval of the independent traffic monitor. Um, so as part of the Section 61 findings, both MassDOT and the Gaming Commission must approve of the independent traffic monitor that will initially conduct a baseline uh, traffic study before the project opens, as well as ongoing traffic monitoring that will take place after Encore opens for a period of uh, 10 years, I believe. Uh, now, Encore has selected STV Incorporated as the independent monitor. Um, STV is a multidisciplinary engineering firm with over uh, 2,200 employees around the country with about 120 here in Boston. Um, STV is on the MassDOT list of approved consultants and has been specifically approved by MassDOT for this monitoring project as well. Uh, so as part of their approval, uh, they require that Encore consult with the communities in which the monitoring work is being conducted. Um, we also felt that this outreach was a very important part of that monitoring plan. Uh, in your packets is a letter from STV requesting approval by the Gaming Commission. Um, also, uh, STV's qualifications package, uh, the MassDOT approval of STV, and the proposed scope of work for the monitoring project. Um, we are recommending that uh, the Gaming Commission approve STV as the independent traffic monitor. Of course, the Gaming Commission has the authority to rescind this approval at any time if we felt that, that were necessary. Um, and again, we have Jim Folk, uh, Paul, and Dustin here uh, to answer any questions that you might have. And just to clarify, <clears throat> if I want to make sure I'm reminded of the process. The, li the licensee was able to choose, correct? And then we did our own due diligence on the uh, proposal, correct? Correct. It wasn't done pursuant to a competitive procurement that we issued. No, it was not. That was, yeah, that, it's, it's Encore's choice of who they would like to use, and they got MassDOT's buy-in and our buy-in that they were sufficiently independent and qualified to do the work. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. Thank you. I see you've done a lot of local work here, correct? Yes. yes. So it's not a new region that you haven't worked before, and um, you've, you've done similar projects, correct? It might be we, we have, yes. Would if, you if like I, uh, to expound on that, maybe? For I'd, I'd be happy to. My name is Paul Terrell. I'm a vice president with STV. I've been with STV for about 15 years now. Um, our, our footprint is Boston. Our, our footprint is our primary clients, our MassDOT and the MBTA. Um, significant projects that we've done, uh, the Greenbush commuter rail line. We just finished the Longfellow Bridge for MassDOT where we mitigated traffic for five years on that project. We're the lead consultant for the Green Line extension. Um, we do an awful lot of work for the state uh, in all aspects of transportation. Um, I, I should mention, although I, I, don't, I have not met uh, uh, Mr. Terrell or, or others in the, in the team, I am quite familiar with, uh, with, with the firm STV. Uh, they did a lot of work for uh, the school building authority uh, when I was there, and I'm, I'm sure they, they continue to do that work. In a similar capacity, they did a lot of assessment of schools um, on behalf of the state when, uh, when we were trying to figure out funding decisions and, uh, and whatnot. We were fortunate enough to receive that contract twice where we uh, worked for the School Building Authority mm -hmm. assessing all of the schools in Massachusetts. Yeah. So we were, we were proud to have received that once, but we did the job so well, we were successful in being uh, um, selected a second time. Mm -hmm. And they, they draw on a number of uh, engineers and architects that do a lot of, a lot of the work. Now, fortunately, we have 120 people in the Boston office alone, full-service architectural and engineering firm. Vehicle, we uh, procure the vehicles for the MBTA. So we understand transportation from, from the, the footprint of the vehicles all the way to the delivery, uh, fare, uh, fare collections and everything that the MBTA does as well as MassDOT. Is there anything different or challenging about this particular project that you haven't quite seen before or is it very uh, no nothing we look forward to being able to validate the numbers that have been that were um, estimated um, it's interesting because 
of some of the construction work that's ongoing in the area mm -hmm. um, that's not associated with the gaming authority and we have challenged we have discussed it the green line is impacting some of the numbers and so we're going to have to take a look, good look at those to make sure that we have the appropriate numbers um, as we think they should be mm -hmm. i should also probably note that um, they they had not been involved in any prior gaming related assessment either for the licensee in the past or other applicants. So I think uh, that's a very positive in this case um, because some of the um, conditions that we imposed uh, relate to the outcome of this um, monitoring, of the traffic monitoring. Yes. So, um, so that there's no any question as to the, any kind of motivation or ulterior motives, um, I think that really is also a very important aspect. Yeah, and if I can um, just add, if you don't mind. Um, so just one of the reasons that we, sure. we selected STV, um, I actually, in my past job, I worked at the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority uh, in charge of their transportation. I was, as well, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer at the MBTA, and um, I've had STV do work in the past for um, a few projects that were directly correlated to something that I was working on, and they've done a fantastic job. So. You know, we, we have had other um, consultants look at the traffic monitoring, you know, pre, like obviously before the construction started, but this had to be independent. So um, that's why one of the reasons we selected STV because of their experience um, in this state, um, the years of experience, and they're a local company. Mm -hmm. So we were going to have them obviously check all the, the turning um, at all the intersections that we, we want. They're obviously going to be working with the MBTA to get counts on the MBTA bus routes. Um, and then they're going to, you know, when we're working, like Joe said, the cities um, and getting their point of view and making sure that they're satisfied in everything that we're doing moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously a challenging area with traffic. <laughs> Just a little. I have the South Boston waterfront, so I'm used to it. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Delaney or Mr. Ziemba, do you want to add anything? No, I think that's sufficient. So um, uh, unlike the other items, we are asking for the Commission's vote on that. There's a number of counts that um, these folks need to get done over the next uh, couple of weeks. Further discussion, questions from the Commissioners? Do we have a motion then? Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move that uh, the Commission approve the, uh, the firm of STV Incorporated to function as the independent traffic monitoring for the, um, the work at uh, the Boston, uh, the Anchor Boston Harbor scope. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was going off, off the cuff. There was a selection here. Um, I, mean, I move that, uh, let, me re let me strike that and um, make a motion again. I move that the Commission approve the selection and engagement of STV Incorporated as the independent transportation monitor, as is fully described in the memorandum from um, Ombudsman Siemba and uh, Oversight Manager um, uh, Delaney, included in the Commission packet, and further move that the Commission may rescind its approval of STV as the independent transportation monitor at any time in the Commission's discretion and require the selection and engagement of a different independent monitor if, that, uh, if the Commission decided that was necessary. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Just clarify that the uh, condition upon a potential rescission. We don't anticipate that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the uh, approval of changes to the Encore Boston Harbor design. Um, so now the Gaming Commission has reviewed the Encore design a number of times um, throughout the project's history um, and voted a, an approval of the final design in October of 2016. Since that time, 
a notice of project change was filed that changed the number of hotel rooms and the mix of square footage and so on and so forth. Um, and in addition to that, there's been some other you know, minor project changes that have happened since that time, just you know, uh, refinements to the project that happen in the course of any kind of construction. Um, just as a matter of a couple of the highlights, I won't go into all of the items that are in the uh, memo because it's, it's rather extensive. Um, the restaurant program has been finalized uh, at the notice of project change. The square footages of the food and beverage outlets was increased, but the program had not been fully defined. So there are now uh, 15 food and beverage outlets that are identified in the memo. Um, Square footages, as I mentioned, were updated at the notice of project change stage and are outlined in the revised section 61 findings that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the final sediment remediation alternative was defined. Uh, items related to employee parking and off-site park and ride locations have been uh, secured. Um, and also a daycare facility is being constructed uh, by Encore at uh, Station Landing. There are also a couple of um, additional items that are related to the project but that are not part of the Gaming Commission's approval that we just wanted to keep you apprised of. Uh, the first one is the uh, River Green parking lot. Uh, Encore had purchased what was known as the former GE facility on Air Force Road as a location to relocate um, uh, pro uh, properties that they had bought out on Broadway. Um, there was some extra space on that site, so they approached the City of Everett about constructing a temporary parking lot on that location. So the City has approved that, and that uh, parking lot's now under construction. Also, across Broadway from the project site is the what's known as the community parking lot. Uh, this is a temporary 800-space parking lot that's being constructed across Broadway from the facility, which will be operated by the City of Everett for a period of up to three years. Um, 100 spaces of that will be used for uh, queuing for ride share services with the remainder for general parking. Um, also, Encore is uh, refining the number of gaming positions as the project approaches opening. And I'll turn this over to uh, Jackie Crum to provide some additional information on this item. Sure. So uh, in our original MEPA uh, filings, what we did was we had to um, propose a formula for traffic generation. So obviously, uh, the state has uh, sufficient information about how much traffic is generated by you know, uses such as restaurants or movie theaters, um, but they did not have that information for casinos. So they looked, they, they did some research, we did some research on benchmark casinos. We looked at casinos in um, St. Charles, Missouri, the Hollywood Casino in Ohio, Sugar House in Pennsylvania, Resort World Casino at Aqueduct in Queens, uh, New York, Casino de Montreal in Quebec, and Rivers Casino in Pennsylvania. And ultimately, based on the um, facilities that had the most similar market area and demographic bases, uh, number of gaming positions and resort amenities, and access to public transportation, three of these were selected, and we proposed to MEPA a formula for uh, counting the number of uh, counting the traffic that would be generated by um, our casino. Based on that, sorry, this is a long explanation, but based on that, uh, MEPA approved six positions per gaming table and one position per slot machine. So to date, all of our MEPA filings have followed that formula. Um, in, I believe it was January of this year, uh, the Gaming Commission uh, proposed a revised formula to calculate the, the number of gaming positions. And for instance, uh, as opposed to our six per table, craps went up to 14, uh, roulette went to seven, and uh, poker, which is somewhat significant for our property, went from six to 10 positions. As a result, uh, if you look at the number of gaming positions that the Gaming Commission uses, it's quite significantly higher than that which we proposed for MEPA. Uh, we intend to address this with MEPA uh, to try to get to an apples to apples comparison. Uh, you, our thought is, although the same word is used, gaming positions, it may be different for purposes of MEPA filings than it is for the Gaming Commission calculation. Attorney um, Crum, I just need to understand, uh, when you first went to MEPA, you said MEPA adopted 
So okay. we w did. Was that at your proposal? It was. So we initially we, it was six for all except a, was it nine for slots or what was it? One for slots. One so for, yeah. one, one one to for one six yeah. per, per seat per table and then six for right. And tables. that was that was based on an average rather than an actual number of seats because so they were trying to understand more. You know, the casino wouldn't be operating at full capacity every day. So that was your proposal to me, but MEPA issues its order based on that proposal. And then you said the Gaming Commission presented others. Was that based on your a newly revised proposal from Encore? Or was no, that, that was that was done uh, by the Gaming Commission. I think to reflect, and, and I'm not going to speak to uh, to what the gaming, but I think to reflect the actual number of seats. So, um, can I ask maybe the question? Uh, uh, just a follow-up. Um, when um, so, is it fair to say that you have not changed the number of tables from the MIPA? We so if if we're looking at apples to apples, yeah, uh, we're at about 127 positions, additional gaming positions, which which uh, is less than three percent of the number that was proposed in our notice of project change. 127 additional gaming positions. Correct. Um, all together slots and tables. Correct. But the difference between the filing and now in terms of gaming positions is then mostly due to the point that you made, which is the recalculation, or rather, the fine calculation of seats per table. That's correct. And that's obviously a significantly higher number. You know, I was just looking at um, the poker tables alone. So under our original formula, we would have had 528 gaming positions, yeah. and that's increased to 880. Yeah. Five, 528 to 880. That's just on poker. With no no change in the number of tables. Of poker tables. Yes. Um, I guess I didn't really realize this was the source. Um, can I uh, uh, go back to? Um, are we approving anything on this matter now? I, no. I've actually, no. um, we are it not. would be a good time for me to personally to take a break. Sure. And secondly, I'd like to get clarification from Mr. Ziamba on just one point because I am not going to be able to clarify that right now. Okay. And so if you wouldn't mind, if we could have a, a 10 minute break, and Mr. Ziamba, if I could just sure. ask a question. Thank you. Will we convene the meeting, please? And thank you for um, your patience. Attorney Crum, if you'd like to continue. Or, uh, I think, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, uh, did you want to get further clarify, or you were asking a question? Well, you know, I actually um, I got some background relative to the change that uh, Attorney Crum is referring to that we, uh, that we did back in uh, last January. Is that? Uh, Executive yeah, so Joshua, just to, could you yeah, uh, further explain it? Put it a little bit in perspective, Commissioners. Um, I think uh, CFO, CFAO Lennon had made a recommendation at the time to, uh, for lack of a better term, true up the numbers at some of the tables. They're using an average of six. All tables are not created equally, as uh, Attorney Crum uh, articulated, and we were trying to. Um, rationalize our assessment ac across our licensees. So uh, Derek came in with a recommendation of why don't we use, um, I don't want to say actual numbers, but potential numbers um, as a way of truing up that assessment. And I can be clear, uh, the, the law of unintended consequences, it was not a comment on environmental policy or anything like that at the time. It was really for another purpose. So, and I think that was, we've, we've had a bit of this conversation about how much of that 
reassessment for um, financial accounting purposes is now affecting this assessment for environmental purposes. And they may be, um, in the end, um, uh, I don't know, we may be now talking apples to oranges in terms of potential positions versus environmental assessment positions. So uh, just want, I'm, I apologize for not catching that and, and giving that commission uh, th that information earlier. And, and just to clarify that that might, um, the fact that you're using numbers that were used for the assessment, uh, the methodology that MEPA relied on might not have been clearly exposed. And so that sounds as though there probably needs to be continuing conversations with MEPA to make sure we have a clear understanding. Is that fair? That's correct. And in the original uh, memo that we submitted to MEPA when, when this was first proposed, um, we did say that it was an average and not an actual. But some of these numbers in the new proposal, for instance, um, poker tables, uh, it, there's a number of 10 positions per poker table. We don't have 10 positions at our poker tables. We only have nine. And so craps tables obviously don't have any chairs. And so that's a number that is a potential number, certainly. But in terms of actual and average, there may be a difference there. Um, I'm, I guess I'm, when we say true up, this is not a true up. These are significant changes in numbers here. And, and you expect to be able to get that through MEPA in a short period of time? So it's, it's not really a significant change. What it is is, I'll give you an example. Our poker tables have not changed the number at all mm -hmm. since we applied to MEPA and since the notice of project change. But the gaming positions, based on the uh, proposed formula from the Gaming Commission, has changed that number significantly. So MEPA originally accepted six per table as an average and calculated their trip uh, uh, generation based on that, accepted our trip generation based on that. And so the question is whether uh, MEPA will continue to use that six or whether it will adjust to the Gaming Commission's proposed formula. I remember that <laughs> the formula that we came in with was for the purposes of the assessment. Yeah. Right. Because that assessment is by statute, by regulation maybe, uh, done on gaming position. But, but uh, to clarify, it, it wasn't the, uh, it, it's numbers that perhaps licensee used, somehow relied on, but it was for a different purpose, as you say, apples and oranges, and so yes. it does, it, it, it does matter for environmental purposes. Right. So I think, um, uh, Mr. Ziemba, do, do we know, um, is NEPA expecting to meet on this? We have we informed uh, MEPA that we've asked Encore to, to go talk to them about this issue. Um, and we're, we're also trying to be in touch with MassDOT as well. And MassDOT needs to be involved as well. Yeah. So and we you have a meeting scheduled yet? We do not have a meeting scheduled yet. We've reached out to both. And um, we will obviously report back as soon as we get feedback from them. But, but I think what you were alluding, Commissioner, yeah. and, and you, you as well, Chair, is that uh, this would be a, a, an answer to come from MEPA if they see that they should at a minimum understand the nuances as to why these jump numbers changed when we clarify for our purposes the number of gaming positions per table right. um, and that the number of tables has not changed significantly. There's only been a change, an addition of 127 positions. That's which, correct. Which, which you just said earlier. Um, which may include slots, whatever the case may be, in terms of refining of those numbers. They need to understand where these discrepancy J Just for a will, point of clarification, from. maybe Attorney Crump can give us the number that she's referencing, that additional 127. That is a number based on the six per average. That's not the total difference between the notice project change gaming positions and the current, uh, if you count every seat, based on this methodology. The, the 127 is if we continue to use the formula that we've previously used with MEFA. So, yes. uh, you know, we filed an EENF, a DEIR, an FEIR, an SFEIR, yes. and an SSFEIR. <laughs> and uh, those numbers were all consistent throughout that process. It, and actually, the, the numbers that the Commission was using for purposes of the, um, of the financial, to determine what portion of the budget we paid, was also using the 621. Until uh, until this change, mm -hmm. 
So, so we can't anticipate yet MEPA's um, reaction or, or, or decision yeah. on this. It's just, I think right now it's something that it's in everyone's interest to move on quickly. Yeah. Is that fair? That is fair. Absolutely. Commissioner, I, I didn't mean to cut you. Oh, no, no. Apologies. I was just trying to understand the changes, the numbers, and um, the formula. So um, I, it's, it's a little different than I thought it was. Okay, are you ready, want, ready to move want, on from do that? Do you want to have those questions more precisely answered? We don't need to move well, on. Well, we are not moving on this matter today. No, uh, right. So I think that there's time to, um, to really understand it better, and I'll, I'll take that opportunity. Any further questions on that particular matter? Commissioner O'Brien, all set? All right, we're all set, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thankfully we're not uh, asking you to make any vote on that today, um, but we are recommending that, um, that, those, that the changes be voted along with the Section 61 approval, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, so the next item uh, is the detailed construction schedule. Um, the Gaming Commission approved an opening date for the facility, uh, but has not yet approved the underlying construction schedule, uh, which is required by 205 CMR 135. Uh, in your packet, it's a high-level summary of the schedule showing the completion dates for the major components of the resort and for the off-site improvements. Um, as Peter uh, Campo explained during his quarterly report, uh, project is schedule is on schedule for opening on June 23rd. Uh, Encore plans to file with the City of Everett for a certificate of occupancy on June 1st, with an expected uh, CO on June 10th. Uh, and we have no reason uh, right now to believe that that will not happen. Uh, we, as the Gaming Commission, continue to coordinate with the appropriate appropriate entities on the off-site roadway improvements. Those including MassDOT, City of Boston, City of Everett some of the other surrounding communities um, to ensure that all of those portions of the project are satisfactorily completed before uh, op the project opens. Um, and the one other item is the, that the related to schedule is that the commission also needs to vote the final stage of construction, uh, which allows the construction bond to be returned to Encore. Um, essentially what we're proposing in, in conjunction with Encore is that the final stage of construction will coincide with the issuance of the certificate of operations. So when we issue that certificate, whether it's June 22nd, 1st, 2nd, whatever it is, that would coincide with the same day as the, uh, uh, the um, final stage of construction, and at that point the bond could be released to Encore. Final stage culmination or? Well, you know, the way that the, the reg is written is really designed for someone putting up a cash deposit. Uh, you know, if someone put up a $50 million cash deposit, they actually need that money towards the to end of the project it. to finish it. Because this is a bond, releasing the bond doesn't really do anything. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't free up money to finish the project. So we just said, let's just do it in, in conjunction with the operation certificate. Sounds good. And then, so project is done, ribbon is cut, bond can be released. Um, and again, we're recommending that the uh, final construction schedule uh, be voted along with the vote that you take on Section 61 findings uh, in a couple weeks. Okay, so the, uh, any questions on the construction schedule? Okay. There, well, just one, oh, one sure. question. There will be um, test nights and the sort between the June 10th expected certificate of occupancy and the opening date, I presume. That's right. But we don't have that information yet? Um, it was, the, that's not, the test nights, that's not really called for in the, in the construction reg that we're referencing. Okay. As part of the opening process, we'll detail, you know, rather significantly all of the various uh, uh, steps, including the test nights, uh, as we get a little bit closer towards opening. At a later we're, time. We're pre pretty close, I admit. <laughs> yeah. but. I do have one question around the daycare facility. I think that that's going to come a little bit later, but you've made some temporary arrangements. Is that correct? Or you are in the process of doing so? Right. So just to give you a little bit of an update on the daycare facility, we have signed a lease um, at Wellington Circle, which is where a majority of our employees um, will be parking. 
Um, so we think it'll be convenient for families to drop their children there and then take the shuttle into the, uh, into the property because our employees are not entitled to park on property as part of our MEPA filings. Uh, with, so we signed the lease. We have partnered with an organization that uh, provides the Head Start program. And uh, just in terms of the construction and getting that done, getting them in there, they've got a pretty hefty uh, process to get through their final approvals um, that delayed it past the opening. So what we're going to do is we're looking at various alternatives, both with the, the, both with the uh, provider that is going to operate our uh, daycare center uh, to see where they can house children uh, during an interim period. And we're also looking at uh, other options for whether we can uh, supplement in home care or at other facilities within the area that may be convenient to, uh, to our employees' residences as well. So it would be a combination of center-based and family-based centers that the Head Start organization is orchestrating temporarily. That's correct, but we're also looking at uh, other organizations that offer uh, that are not part of the Head Start program okay. to supplement that to make sure, sure that we've got the employees covered. And then the site itself, will, your operator will eventually be ABCD. That's that's yes, correct. That's great. Yes. Thank you. And what is the ETA for when they're actually going to open? We were hoping that uh, September would be the date, but we think it's more likely to be November. So we're looking at the first six months after opening to provide the alternative just to give us a little bit of cushion to make sure that the families are covered. Do you have an internal deadline and when you're going to come up with the alternative for that six-month period? Uh, so Peter had told me September, and then uh, I heard because of the additional work that ABCD would need to do after they take over the facility that that's m uh, more likely to be a month or a month and a half to get the uh, federal approvals that they need. I mean, the, the interim solution. Do you have an internal deadline oh. for when you're going to come up with your six-month coverage? Uh, we would definitely need to do that with, uh, by the end of May. Okay. And just to close the loop, do you have an anticipated number of children that you'll be serving? Do you, are you ask, how are you estimate? Are you able to estimate that fairly? The facility, and Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it accommodates 62 children, which is, um, they, they have a toddler program as well as an infant program. Okay. Um, so the next uh, section is the uh, revised Section 61 findings. So in your packet, you will find uh, the second revision to the Section 61 findings. We had done a, a, a revision earlier uh, related uh, to the study of the pedestrian bridge. Um, but what you'll find here are uh, the changes really reflect a lot of the refinements that happened during the notice of change process, square footages and the like, um, as well as the completion of the Lower Mystic Working Group, uh, some references to that. So some of the, the project-related changes, and we've talked about a couple of these before, the final alternative for sediment remediation is identified in there. Um, we did a couple of changes to the uh, water transportation sector that John alluded to earlier. Um, this section reflected some changes uh, due to the boats being constructed for the facility. What we've done is we've changed the Section 61 finding to create more of a performance-based standard than a, than a prescriptive standard based on the number of boats and seats. Uh, in your packet is a, uh, a memo that was put together by AECOM that talks about how they're going to meet uh, all of the underlying um, mode splits and so on for the, uh, for the use of the boats. Uh, a couple other minor things. Uh, during uh, um, some value engineering, uh, th there had been a row of skylights that was going all the way down the the main corridor uh, from the, the retail and restaurant spaces all the way down into the convention area. Uh, those were being done primarily for LEED purposes, and the elimination of those didn't affect the LEED certification anyway, so uh, we were fine with that. Um, there was also a requirement to use uh, energy efficient gaming equipment, and we found that there really isn't any. Uh, equipment of that nature. We ran into the same thing with MGM and changed their Section 61 findings to reflect that. Um, and you'll see an, a bunch of other very minor changes in there um, that reflect, um, you know, the current uh, plans for the site. 
Uh, there's also some uh, minor revisions to the proportional share language that uh, was based on earlier discussions and the completion of the Lower Mystic work, Working Group. Um, and nothing in these changes modifies uh, the reopener clause that we have in the Section 61 findings. Um, enclosed in your packet is the uh, environmental monitor schedule. Uh, in order to get these changes into the monitor uh, for May 22nd, they would need to be approved by the Commission on May 14th with a submission to MEPA by May 15th. Um, this would allow uh, only one week for, changes, for comments on the changes. Uh, there is an ability to go out a little bit further, and it sounds like based on the discussions we've had about more about the gaming positions and, and the further uh, contact with MEPA, that may want to be something the Commission considers. Um, so we can, I don't have that right in front of me, the schedule, but that pushes everything out two weeks, which still gets us uh, into the uh, environmental monitor before the facility opens. Um, and again, so we're recommending that the Commission put these changes out for public comment um, with the final uh, Section 61 findings being voted at uh, time determined by the Commission. Just for point of clarification, do we normally put things out for one week or two weeks in this context? Well, usually two weeks is the standard okay. or more. Okay. And it's doable when we do the traditional two-week comment period. It still fits within the timeline, correct? So if we did the two-week period, we would miss the next environmental monitoring date. Um, the publication schedule would require uh, a filing by the, instead of the 15th of May, would require a filing by the end of May, and that would appear in the environmental monitor on June 10th. June 10th is the last date before the proposed opening of uh, June 23rd. So uh, the, if you did a shorter period, you could file by the 15th, and then we have a monitor appearance before the end of May. If you miss that and you go to the end of May, we still get the final monitor period of the, of the June 10th monitor publication date. And then so it could be completed prior to the anticipated Eight opening. Later. Yes. I would note um, that uh, given that there is not a significant change to the six, Section 61 findings um, from the first time that we promulgated, that we approved them, um, and in the context of what clearly appears to be a very tight schedule relative to the monitor, I would be comfortable with the one week for comment period. It's rather tight. It's not what we've done in the past necessarily. Um, but I think uh, observers of, of these um, these items here could really um, be alerted to it. So, Commissioners, the only thing I would add to that um, is um, there are a couple other items on the agenda that we might want to put out for public comment also, including the um, revisions to the gaming establishment and the draft on mm -hmm. for Boston Harbor alcohol permit. So right. maybe once we get through all those things, um, you want to address um, the date to put all these things out to comment. It might be helpful to come back at the same time for all of these items. Yeah. Okay. My preference would be the two weeks. I don't. It's doable, and I don't see any reason to shorten the comment period if we can do it. I think it should be two weeks. Well, and I think there are some issues here that are changing. Um, so I, I do think um, that makes a difference, and this is such a critical issue around this project. Um, and, and you're referring to the position. I am, yes. I, I, and, and I did hear Mr. Delaney say because we, no we noted this, uh, the need to address this properly with MEPA, how does I'm not sure if I completely understand how that will be addressed within a one week, it, it, how we could go forward with one week. Um, it would be rather difficult to get something addressed with MEPA in a one week period. Mm -hmm. but even, even though that they're uh, very capable people. Oh, but we want to be fair. To help me All understand, right. the, our Section 61 findings do not necessarily run counter to a MEPA determination that they, for example, would not require a notice of project change for the gaming positions. 
Are, there is a reference to the, the number under the notice of project change of gaming positions. That is included within the current draft. So the current, the, the proposed draft that we would put up for comment reflects um, the uh, notice of project change gaming positions. It includes that 4421. Not the prior one. The one that might be required by MIPA if they view these numbers to be uh, different from what they uh, were initially given. If, if they view these numbers as different, then it would require a more formal filing in all likelihood. Right. And that, could, that might carry on well past the opening. Yes. But my point is that it's not contingent on our drafting of the Section 61 findings. Those two are separate events. Approving them a week from now. Um, I, I do think that they, they, are, they are linked. If there's any disagreement regarding the methodology, mm -hmm. then um, it, it's sort of a weird situation. If there's disagreement with the methodology, then the draft revisions as they currently sit would be fine. They would be able to move forward. If there is disagreement? Yes, because or then it would isn't. require f a further filing to make a, uh, an increase to the number of gaming positions. But the current filing reflects that 4421, which is the notice of project change uh, gaming positions. And what was the 4421 again? That's the total number of gaming positions in the uh, notice of project change. In the last one? 2017. Right. Right, and again, to be fair to everyone, including me, but we don't want to put words in Mipa's mouth, we don't know how they'll view this mm -hmm. change. Correct. They may say it's within a certain uh, expect their regular expectation. It's just that they are not here, and yeah. we can't anticipate their viewpoint at all. So um, <clears throat> I'm hearing Commissioner O'Brien um, argue for two weeks. We did anticipate that there was a proposal for one week. I'd, I'd like to just hear from you, Ombudsman Ziemba, as to whether you could accommodate, of course, a longer notice period, yeah. we, or we, if we could segment it out if we need I, to. We can, we can accommodate the longer period. Um, the hesitancy is we, have, we only have two filing dates left. And so if, um, if something unanticipated came up, um, that might be an issue, but we can accommodate the longer period. Two in addition to the, the one that's coming up, or two? Two, two, two total. Two, okay, that's right. Total, okay. inclusive of the, of the next one. In other words, a two a two week comment period leaves no room for error. That's right. I After that, this is such a significant mm -hmm. part of this project, and it has been from day one. Um, that I I am comfortable with two weeks. I think it's a really important piece of our project, um, and that we need to give uh, people a chance to weigh in on this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we haven't, we, we have not marked this up for a formal vote. I think that it's probably fair to, uh, that uh, we hope that, I think there's three of us who at least are suggesting that two weeks is a better practice. I mean, we would love to give more notice always. Right. Um, and if that can be arranged, we would, and even if it means somehow mm -hmm. we have to tighten up on other ends, that would be our right. recommendation. My fellow commissioners to the left, oh, would you like to discuss this further? Um, well, you know, I think that's a, that's a good summary. We do have a scheduled meeting for the next week. Is that, is that um, fair or do we know whether we'll have a meeting um, So we had anticipated potentially something as early as mm, the 14th, I believe. Uh, but we could um, we could adjust that. I also would if um, maybe take a short break because there's one or two other issues on the other items. I just want to have a discussion with to see if we should put the whole all those three items over for that two week period. Mm -hmm. And I assume so. Uh, if that were the case, I would work with the chair and the rest of the commissioners to determine you know what the meeting would be right after that two week period. Right, and I alluded to that we might have to. We might have to segment right. and then do mm -hmm. one for the one week, provided right. it's a, a good 
a, a good practice. Thank you. I'm happy to um, accommodate a, another short break. Everybody, thank you for your patience. Thank you. We'll convene uh, again at 1135. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone, for your patience as we deal with some uh, scheduling issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, Ombudsman Ziemba had the floor, but you would. Uh, sure, sure. So I'll just um, uh, preempt Mr. Ziemba for one second, which is I think we can accommodate uh, uh, the desire of the Commission um, and um, in our past practice, our past practice, and uh, put. Um, most of the items, if not all the items, we will put out for public comment, including the Section 61s, the liquor license, and the property delineation for a two-week period. Do it two weeks from today and tentatively, I always say tentatively, um, uh, potentially have a meeting on May 20th, which is uh, uh, two weeks from today, um, uh, to, to resolve those issues. May 20th. Yes. So it works. Uh, would would mean well no no never mind I, I right now I we there have been some talk about the 14th we'll we'll see well, obviously we'll post in compliance with the open meeting if we're going to have one on the 14th as we always do we will accommodate the, our commission's work and um, be as nimble as necessary with our meetings giving proper notice and uh, right now there's a tentative uh, plan for May 20th for our next meeting and that will give time for everyone to really sort out these details. Okay. And Mr. So Ziemba Mr. Ziemba likes to throw a curveball at me all, you know, all the time. So we will have to consider, uh, which he's not, uh, which he's correct on, um, whether the comment period can uh, coincide with the um, with the meeting schedule, um, and let's talk about that behind scenes because we do want to make sure the commission has plenty of time, appropriately to uh, yeah right um, analyze all the comments. So we will work at that. So tentatively the 20th, but we just want to make sure the commission has enough time. So um, we'll look at the schedule, whether we need to move it out a day or two, so you can have time for the comments. Mr. Ziemba, you all set? <laughs> Enough trouble for today, <laughs> Chair. Okay, so the last item that we have uh, is the opening day uh, traffic planning. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Bob DeSalvio from Encore Boston Harbor for a high-level discussion of the opening day, week, month uh, kind of traffic planning activities. Uh, we expect as the project gets closer to opening, we'll have Encore back in front of us to provide a more detailed plan of the opening day activities. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Um, I am actually uh, joined today not only by uh, Jackie Crum, who's up at the front, but also I want to acknowledge that the significant portion of the preparation of even this high level summary and of course all the transportation was done under the auspices of two of our really capable team members and uh, I know you heard from Jim Falk who uh, is our executive director of transportation and uh, I'm assuming you know about his background in terms of large movements of folks uh, in and around the BCEC and other projects but also um, the co-head of this particular effort has been Rich Pryor 
um, who, as you know, is our executive director of security and investigations, and through his extensive background with the state police, um, has had lots of um, interaction and experience as it relates to whether it's large movements or people and or large gatherings. Um, so uh, I want to thank these gentlemen, and I'm here to really present the summary of a lot of their effort. I will tell you that um, this particular aspect of the project um, I stayed very close to. Um, I know that this has been a subject for, um, you know, now I'm about a little over five years into the project, and uh, if this was, this was probably the number one topic uh, that we had at all of our public meetings. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to stay close to this one personally. I will tell you that I attended um, Jim and Rich organized very large scale update meetings with probably upwards of, I don't know, 40, 50 people at each one through with law enforcement and other transportation professionals, the T and DOT. Um, I attended every one of their working sessions myself except for one when I was out of town. Um, I wanted to make sure that um, I stayed close to it because I knew there's going to be a lot of questions about this. So um, just to basically reiterate that we take this particular aspect of the project extremely serious. Um, the opening slide is really a sort of a combination that shows many of the different methods that we are going to be using to encourage visitors to attend the facility and leave their car at home or leave their car at another location and then use mass transit uh, to come in. And so you'll see it's a combination of items that we're going to be talking about, whether it's the orange line or the water or premium motor coach or local buses. Um, so we'll cover them all. Um, we, as we move to this next slide, I want to highlight a couple of the key opportunities for folks to, um, um, again, leave the car at home. First and foremost, um, we are right in the final uh, production and uh, commissioning of our uh, Encore Premium Harbor shuttles. We are very excited about this service, as you know. Um, we're going to have a route that runs from Encore uh, to the seaport and the financial district. Um, these are ADA compliant, brand new, gorgeous water shuttles that were built uh, right in Charlestown. And we look forward to them uh, getting out on the water very soon. We're going to run um, early morning into the evening, seven days a week, um, weather dependent. Um, we've studied this quite a bit. We know that there are rare instances when the ice and or the uh, weather is so bad that it doesn't allow for safe passage. So of course, we'll be um, operating no different than anyone else who's out on the water, and it's always uh, safety first. So there may be a few times when, uh, uh, when operation is not feasible, uh, but for the most part, we're all year long. Um, the next item is interesting. Could I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, they look very nice, by the way, but they're a little smaller than anticipated, mm -hmm. uh, but you still anticipate getting um, the same amount of folks there via water? That that's, that's correct, because we actually, um, for, we are working with an operator that decided on their own to add a fourth vessel. So we had, our commitment was for three. Turns out that you are correct. They are slightly less capacity based on working with the Coast Guard but the operator uh, chose to add a fourth uh, exact same vessel. Mm -hmm. So we'll wind up with the full seating capacity that we had. And even though that vessel uh, comes online a little, the fourth vessel comes online a little later in the summer, we're gonna supplement that with other service they're gonna be providing. So we'll have the capability to do the numbers that we anticipated. It just turned out to be pretty much four boats instead of three. So frequent, more frequent trips with the fourth Yeah, boat. absolutely. It even actually probably is a better setup than where we originally started. Because folks are very patient in Boston. Is that your experience? Um, <laughs> extremely patient. Thank um, you. So we are excited about that. Um, the, you know, the issue, and there's been a lot written about this recently, about how fares intersect with ridership. And so Jim and I had many hours of discussion about how to make this work. And we thought that the best approach would be to come out with very aggressive uh, introductory pricing. So as you can see, we put in there that it's uh, $7 a trip, which is actually well below 
what is current market for even short water taxi legs in the harbor. So this is an elevated experience at a very reasonable price. The reason you do that for anybody who's been involved in marketing is to get the initial ridership up as quickly as possible. So uh, Jim and I chatted about that. And then there was, um, there's also been a lot written re recently about um, uh, whether commuters could even jump on segments of our leg. Um, and, and in reality, there is a short leg that you can go from financial district to the seaport. So we, we put out there that we're gonna have a, a $5 version of a short leg. And again, that'll help just move people around with the idea of us connecting with the other water transit our options in the harbor. And uh, the folks that uh, do these kinds of services were pretty excited, um, especially the folks at Mott and the Convention Center uh, and uh, other businesses in the area. Um, so again, that service will start. Uh, we'll, we'll do some test runs, uh, but it'll be ready for the day that we open. Um, the MBTA Encore Shuttle. Um, so we have multiple routes there. They go from Malden Station and Wellington. Um, we've got brand new 58 uh, passenger ADA compliant vehicles. Um, those are going to be free to the general public and our employees. Um, so they'll be, and they're going to operate basically the T hours. Uh, so from uh, 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. seven days a week. Um, we're also going to have a, um, as part of our commitment, an Encore neighborhood shuttle. So that's a system that will run with new uh, 26 passenger ADA compliant vehicles as well. Again, free uh, to the general public and to our employees. And those pretty much run 24 hours, seven days a week as part of the process. Uh, and we've got a nice route set up with that where it'll go from uh, Encore to River Green over to the city, uh, near City Hall area in Everett Square. And then um, we're we pick the spot right by the uh, Silver Line stop in Chelsea. So again, be another opportunity for people to use uh, different uh, methods of mass transit to get to and from the facility. And then the last on this page is the, what we're calling the premium motor coach service, similar to what you think about as a, uh, like a premium park and ride. Uh, here we're going from Millbury, which is out towards Worcester, uh, Rockland and uh, Londonderry, New Hampshire, where we know we're gonna get a large pocket of business coming from the north. Um, those, again, are new 56-passenger ADA-compliant um, luxury coaches. Again, a very reasonable seven bucks for that trip. Um, so again, the whole idea is to get people on these services as quickly as possible to help take the burden off the roads. Uh, we'll run them for approximately a 12-hour period, uh, seven days a week. Um, Bob, the, before you leave yes. this slide, um, so this is mostly preparations for the opening uh, period, or uh, what elements it's, will remain mostly? It's actually mostly? both. Um, so, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, further in the presentation, but we think of this as not a one-day concept, because we know that the opening period of any of these resorts um, extends for quite a while. So we, we think of it as the opening week, we also think of it as the opening 90-day period. And, um, and all the meetings that we had with our, in particular, our law enforcement partners, um, what they said is um, a lot of this is going to be a game day call. So the, the police are prepared to provide whatever backup we need in terms of assistance on these roadways for as long as it takes to make sure that we've got this under control. And if that means it's the first seven days straight, it's fine. If it's the first 14 days straight, if it turns out being, um, you know, our, obviously our peak times Friday evening, Saturday and Sunday day shift, it may be that after the opening day period, this might resort more to a, um, a weekend type operation until we, we finally get it to the period where you get some semblance of regularity in terms of what the flow is. But there's clearly going to be a new kid on the block syndrome. You're going to have a lot of initial trial. And all of our partners have said that they will work with us all the way through that. And by the way, the other agency I want to talk about, we've got great cooperation from the MBTA. They've even made some shifts in terms of some of their um, maintenance schedules to make sure that orange line availability would be appropriate during this 
uh, period because, as you know, they have a significant amount of work done. So I will tell you that every partner has chipped in and said that they will help us all the way through this to make sure that the resources are available because it's, it's almost impossible to say when that opening sort of period starts and stops. Part of this is going to be that we are going to have to make uh, weekly and or daily game day calls. So, Mr. DeSalvio, you've committed to the law enforcement professionals, many of whom are here today mm -hmm. in support of this, um, to let them make those calls, meaning if they come back to you and say, look, we're really busy, we need to extend this for another couple of days. We're all in. Okay. Okay. And so, and you know, that's one of the advantages of having uh, Rich on the team. He's got, obviously got long-standing relationships with everyone. Um, the uh, state police is going to be uh, setting up one of their mobile command centers. Um, uh, again, uh, kudos to the T. They're going to let us use their facility uh, right next to the property so we can actually um, set that uh, com mobile command center up. And, um, you know, the, here, here's, uh, bless you. Um, here's the great thing about being in eastern Massachusetts after, I have to tell you, even going through some of the first sessions, um, we all have trepidations about making sure that we cover everything. But when you hear the law enforcement professionals talk about how they handle major events in and around eastern Massachusetts almost weekly, when you think about all the different events that happen here, these folks know what they're doing. And so they've been a great partner, and um, we're more than happy to take their lead. But before, again, uh, one more uh, question. Some of the service that you uh, highlighted in this slide is going to be free, uh, but has multiple stops at times. Um, does that take away from people who ultimately want to get to the property, and some might want to just save a little walking in between points, for example? Is well, that a consideration? I mean, I'll give you an example. We had a long discussion with the city of Everett on the neighborhood shuttle, yeah. and they we were debating, do we charge, do we not charge employees? But at the end of the day, the whole idea was to get people out of their cars. So in a case like that, the city was really anxious and didn't really want us to put a charge on that. We didn't want to, obviously we don't want to charge our employees to get to and from work. And so for the, you know, we're going to evaluate it all. And if it turns out that it's highly successful and we have to put another section on, We'll certainly consider doing that, but the idea in both the areas where it's free, meaning the connections from the T stops, as well as the neighborhood, mm -hmm. we went on those. We went no charge, and if it turns out, like I said, if we need more service, that's something we'll take a look at. On the others, we put a, a very reasonable pr price to encourage their usage. And again, it's all up for it's all up for evaluation. Um, the next slide um, really kind of highlights um, the already existing extensive assets, a lot of which are in the hands of the T. Uh, and by that, um, you know, you think about the fact that there are 750,000 people that live within walking distance of an Orange Line stop, and you've got all the way uh, from Forest Hills to Oak Grove to think about. Oh, there's a lot of folks that have access to get on the orange line and if they can get on the orange line not only do we have free shuttle service at wellington and at malden center but um, as a lot of folks are starting to do now you can very easily get off at sullivan square and just walk it's a very short walk and as part of our improvement project in sullivan square there's now all new sidewalks all new ada accessible ramps there's a logical pathway to get you from the station. The Alfred Street Bridge construction is done. And so literally, you can get off and walk it on nice weather days. So um, it's just another option for folks. And so we're going to obviously heavily promote the Orange Line. Uh, but then there's also parking. I, we listed here some of the different stations and their parking capabilities. But look at Wellington Station Landing. Uh, out at River Green, at Malden, Wonderland, all these places are where you can either uh, drop a car, take a line, switch lines, and then get over to the facility. So we do want to promote that. Um, and, uh, and of course, this new connection to the new uh, Chelsea Silver Line stop, we think, uh, will be a nice add. On the next slide, um, 
this is a um, interesting uh, method of us connecting to our shuttle stops at Wellington and or at Malden Center uh, by using what's called Mystic View Road. So um, for those of you that don't know, but it, when you get off at, at Wellington, one of the concepts was how do we keep even shuttle buses off of Broadway if possible. So when you come out of Wellington and you go onto the parkway, normally you would go through and uh, go all the way down to Everett and then down Broadway. But there is a way to um, uh, hang a right at Mystic View Road, um, go down by where the Amelia Earhart Dam is, um, there's an area there enough for a turnaround. We've already talked to the DCR about this because this is really in their bailiwick. And then once you get off in that location, you can just jump on the um, DCR Harbor Walk connection that we made and literally walk right over towards the front of the property. And by doing so, we can keep a significant number of shuttle buses from actually ever hitting Broadway. So this was an idea that uh, Jim came up with. Um, he talked to law enforcement about it. They went to the DCR about this, and they've endorsed this as an idea that for now we're using for opening day, um, but in a tour that we did with MEPA just last week, uh, one of the DCR folks was on it and said, you know, at the end of the day, if this turns out to be successful, it's something that we can talk about going forward. But it was just a clever way to keep the shuttles off of Broadway because we know that first uh, uh, June 23rd day is going to be uh, interesting as we try to uh, navigate through one of those large-scale openings. So the blue line in this slide would be the shuttle and the red is the pedestrian. Correct. The pedestrian. Correct. Do. The shuttle is the blue. That You've got that correct, yeah. Commissioner. And so how much, uh, what's the distance of that walk? Uh, I walked it the other day. I just put myself at where you'd get off and walked over to the yeah. property. It took me about 10 minutes to get to the front door. So it's really actually, it's, it's much closer than what you think. Um, I wasn't sure, so I just clocked it. Right. So it's really a short walk and, and a great option to keep some vehicles off of Broadway. Um, the, next, the next slide is actually a larger blow up of what I just described, and it shows you the pathway for both pedestrians and for um, connection for the shuttles using the DCR connector. Uh, so the, where, where's the entrance uh, when, you, uh, when you come, let's say, from the Amelia Earhart Dam? Where do you enter the property? Oh, you go underneath the, um, the dotted line, the yes. dotted red is underneath the railroad tracks. Yes. Uh, we are just down there now. The pathway is done. We're doing landscaping, lighting. So you go underneath the tracks. Yep. You walk around the harbor walk and then over and into the property. Just like the arrow suggests. Just like the arrow you says. Get, you know, and that's yeah. the arrow actually will take you all the way out to Broadway. But you can stop, obviously, right at the end of where that first arrow is by the Port Cashier. Right. Um, the next slide. Um, I mentioned earlier about the cooperation of law enforcement. As you can see, they're willing to put significant resources um, uh, in terms of making sure that this works. And again, they've got a plan that they've worked out with both Rich and Jim about where are all the appropriate places. Um, they know the road network better than anyone else and will continue to work again with, the, with all the different departments. And that's not only state police and local police, but we got the MBTA, the Coast Guard for the waterways, along with the, the state police, Everett, uh, and, and Boston Marine units. So we've got this covered. When we talk Air, about land, and sea. When we talk about details, um, there is, that's, this is significant numbers of uh, public safety professionals. Um, how did we go about, I mean, is this how far out does this stretch? And, and so what this is, is for the opening, not only the opening day, but what we are considering the opening period. And again, the commitment from law enforcement was, as much as it's needed, we'll make mm -hmm. it available. Mm -hmm. So we know that first week, for sure, is going to be a challenge. After that, we're going to wait and see what the midweeks are like. And so the question is, at least after that first week, do we, uh, do we have to uh, have this much presence on a midweek day? We're not sure yet. Uh, it could wind up being a modified schedule, and if we need the full schedule for a longer period, we'll use the full schedule. Mm -hmm. But we got the commitment that they will provide the resources as needed. And these are details? These are details. So these are committed officers? 
Yeah, they're reimbursable details. So they're, obviously we're paying for the service. Right. So they will be at a post, um, at an intersection. Correct. Available to assist with whatever happens. Correct. To get traffic moving. Correct. Reimbursable all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, the next slide, um, the use of signage is critical. Um, and so we have been working for the better part of a year and a half with AECOM as our partner and then going through all the appropriate state agencies um, for a combination of highway and local signage. Um, and so obviously the key is to make sure the motoring public, if they are driving, um, that they know where to go and that cars do not wind up uh, in the wrong place. So you can see this particular slide shows a map of where the wayfinding package is represented by the various dots. Um, and on the next page on uh, the, the following slide, we took this all the way out as far as um, we could on the major roadway network. So this is um, uh, signs on uh, 93, on 90, um, that really uh, handled all the major uh, interchanges where somebody would have to go to and from the property. And so there is an extensive process of getting approval for these. Um, we are right in the final throes of it now after going through um, uh, MassDOT and the local um, communities, uh, and, and our contractor will be installing these signs before we open. Uh, the next slide. Can I can I ask one yeah, more question? Sure. And can we go back to um, uh, the slide? And I failed to ask before the Encore opening pedestrian pathways. Yes. We we talked extensively about the walk the, um, from the DCR connector. We did not talk about the walk um, a, a, across Alfred. There. I mean, that's sure. What. Um, so we, in that particular case, Commissioner, yeah. we have a commitment for, um, to use, and we have two different intersections. Mm -hmm. One, the main site intersection in front of the property, which would be part of the Everett detail. Mm -hmm. And then um, there is a commitment uh, down by uh, Dexter Street that's mm -hmm. actually not in Everett, but it's in the city of Boston. And we've already had, I think we brought this up at a previous update meeting with the commission. We had uh, communication with the city of Boston's transportation department, mm -hmm. and they're ready, willing, and able to assist um, at that particular intersection, again, with a detail um, uh, for crossings. So this would be the community parking lot, getting mm -hmm. those folks across the street to the facility. That's correct. And it's not signaled. It's really it's, just... It is signaled. That right there is the signal. So you're... Okay. Yes. So you're going to ask everyone to come down to the intersection rather than try to cross earlier? So what we're, we're doing is the way the, the community parking lots were set up, they were purposely designed to encourage pedestrians to not use the main site drive, but to go one intersection south. And A, it's going to be a better for them because it's a better place to cross. And B, we set up the pathway so it's a shorter walk. And so what we tried to do by the use of fencing and landscaping, we, now we're not, again, we don't prohibit anyone from using the main site drive, but you sort of encourage it through the use of landscape design to get the pedestrians to feel like, where's my A, safest path to go, B, shortest travel distance. Well, shortest travel will attract people, safest will not, You're frankly. Welcome. But we're hoping for both. Um, and so we designed literally, when we, we designed the pathways out in the front of the property, it was done with this in mind. Mm -hmm. So when they get across, they actually get to cut out all that section where you come in on the main site drive. Okay. So we're hoping that will accommodate that, and then you supplement that with police details. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, you may have addressed this, but most of these are accessible. All are all, all are perfect. accessible. Yes. yes. Thank you. Sure. Um, I am going to go to the slide that says opening public relations and communications. Mm -hmm. So we are currently working with our uh, marketing folks and outside agencies to uh, build awareness about the mass transit plan. Um, to uh, try to minimize uh, the number of folks that use automobiles, 
Um, and this is going to be storylines on everything that I talked to you about earlier, whether it's the uh, premium harbor shuttle, uh, bike share, ride share. By the way, one thing I failed to mention for ride share, um, we do have an accommodation. You know, that's, that's something that's um, kind of intricate in terms of making sure that you get it right in a high volume facility. So there is um, a piece of property across the way where we have a area that the rideshare folks can all congregate. And then uh, through the use of geofencing and the rideshare apps, you can have somebody come out of the building, they tap for a vehicle, the vehicle gets dispatched from the rideshare area and then goes right out to the front door because we don't have storage facility for all the vehicles and you don't want them driving around the street. So this is, we're doing a um, smaller version of what's done at places like airports or Gillette Stadium or other places where you have to manage um, the rideshare if you want it to go effectively. So that, we will be promoting that um, through the rideshare apps. Uh, and of course, using all the media outlets. Um, on the next page, um, again, we're talking about uh, local advisories. Uh, we're going to have advisories on radio stations. We're going to have real time traffic information. Um, we had already um, set up real time traffic information during our construction period on the Win for All app, and that has gone over extremely well. So we'll be able to roll. Uh, with our communications that were originally for construction related issues into guest facing now and let the general public know um, should they need to for um, anything that they, they might need for directions. Uh, of course, using the website, um, we're, we're uh, developing an app that they can use for the premium park and ride so they can actually reserve space. Again, we're trying anything and everything to um, make this easy for folks to uh, hopefully choose something other than using their automobile. And this uh, next page talks about, uh, at the end of the day, you can do everything you want. We need, except you gotta tell people about it. So it's gonna be, we're gonna have to spend some money on this to make sure. So we've got an extensive paid media campaign. It'll be omni-channel. We're gonna use direct, we're gonna use digital, we'll do print, we'll do out of home. We're gonna cover all the bases on this because it's in our best interest to do so. Um, I think that was, those are really the highlights. And I know John uh, and Joe wanted us to sort of do the overview. I believe there'll be some more discussion about this even maybe at a future meeting. But just to let you know that we have thought a lot about this and we've taken this plan very seriously. Uh, and uh, no, I'm sure we didn't think of everything. And um, I know we're, we'll be doing some adjustments after we open. But um, it was a very, very significant planning exercise to get to where we are today. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, I think it's impressive. I, 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 the commitment from all of the agencies, all the planning that's been involved, um, even down to the last detail of, of uh, landscaping, they may accommodate a safer uh, crossing. I, 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 I do think. Uh, the planning is, is really apparent in looking at this uh, plan. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions? Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? Or that you? concludes our report. Thank you so much. And, uh, thank you. Right, do you have the other you. items? Okay. Should we just stay? Yeah. The, okay. the next item is item four, but I think we will take a short break. And um, again, my apologies, but we have quite an agenda today, so this will help us uh, stay right on target. Thank you very much. Um. We'd like to convene, reconvene this meeting. Thank you very much. Next on the items, is number four, IEB, Mr. Van, and um, 
our assistant director band and uh, Todd Grossman. Thank you. We have uh, uh, General Counsel Todd uh, Grossman here with us. Uh, Jackie Crum, Senior Vice President of, <laughs> of Legal, and Bob DeSalvio, the President. Uh, we're here today to talk about the gaming establishment area and an adjustment to uh, a proposed adjustment to that area. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. And just for the record, I'm not the general counsel, so I want to <laughs> defer to to Ms. Blue, who yeah. actually your your official I'm title is <laughs> deputy general yeah. counsel, and duly noted. Thank you, <laughs> General Counsel Blue. <laughs> As Mr. Ban pointed out. Um, the uh, licensee has proposed amending the gaming establishment boundary, which is a, a timely request at this point. The boundary was first set, as you may recall, um, back in uh, 2014, September of 2014, when the gaming establishment boundaries for both this project and for the proposed Mohegan Sun project were established uh, after a hearing uh, where uh, information was presented from all interested parties as to where the boundary should be set. Obviously, the project has changed in, in scope and, and some of the dynamics over time, so it's certainly um, a good idea to have a look at the boundary now. The commission did issue a decision back um, when it first reviewed the project to determine uh, the proper mechanism and analysis for determining where the boundary should be. And essentially what it did back there is set out a four-part test based upon the statute um, in which the commission looked at the <coughs> definition of the term gaming establishment, which is outlined in Chapter 23K, Section 2, as well as some of the de other definitions, including that for gaming area and um, what have you. And essentially it said that there are four things you look at. It includes, the gaming establishment must include the gaming area itself and the hotel, but otherwise, when you're looking at which amenities and where exactly the line should be drawn, you want to look at whether it's a non-gaming structure that is related to the gaming area, that is under the common ownership or and control of the gaming licensee, then the applicant. Um, and fourth, whether the gaming commission actually has some type of regulatory interest in including that piece of the, the premises uh, within the boundaries of the gaming establishment. With those things in mind, the Commission has drawn all the boundaries for all the uh, licensees at this point. The one nuance that I would add uh, that has kind of evolved over time is that the Commission has said, as it pertains to determining whether the particular amenity or part of the premises is a structure or not, We've looked at the, the core of the structure and said, well, that has to be an actual structure, but we have extended the line out um, to areas that are adjacent to actual physical structures uh, that are, in essence, really an extension of the physical structure um, and included those areas within the boundaries of the gaming establishment, too. For example, that would include the plaza area at the MGM Springfield property or the racing apron area at Plain Ridge Park Casino. And that's certainly relevant here today, too, with the proposal that you have before you. Um, so with that, the uh, licensee has uh, submitted a proposed uh, map that has the boundary on it. Um, as a general matter, I think it's fair to say that we support where the boundary is drawn, with a couple of exceptions that we would like to point out to you for consideration. As I understand, there won't be any final vote taken here today, but just a couple of things to uh, have a look at in anticipation of your upcoming vote. Um, and I don't know if we can flip to the map itself. Uh, that it's identified as Exhibit B in your page 20. That's the prior. But that's yeah. the original map there. And there aren't too many substantial changes to the original uh, boundary. I believe it's the next yeah. slide. I 
There it is there. There it is. If you look on the, um, the far east side of that, you'll see there are two cutouts at the far end of the property that appear to be loading docks um, or something of that nature. Um, and we would suggest that those would be proper for inclusion here. It's important to remember some of the types of things that are important um, to ensure that the, the commission and the IEB and Mr. Band and his team have uh, control over. And they, they include things like not just the, the service of alcoholic beverages, but also surveillance um, and security um, and employee licensing and registration. With all of those considerations in mind, uh, we would submit that those two areas uh, would be beneficial to have within the boundary of the gaming establishment. I understand that the armored car uh, uh, drop-offs and pickups may take place in that area as well, and that's certainly a, an area that we want to ensure as part of the gaming establishment. So that's the first uh, area we wanted to bring to your attention. The second part is on the far west side you'll see that that's the outdoor area um, and there's like a narrow uh, the narrow pathway that's included that leads all the way to I guess it's a gazebo uh, area and we certainly don't have any objection to including that but it, it may be beneficial to actually consider including that whole area out to the walkway not including the walkway but out to the walkway um, though as we understand it, all that area will be heavily landscaped and not easily traversable. Uh, for future uh, consideration, in case they decide to ever amend the setup or what have you, it may be easier just to include it um, instead of having this, you know, line that's difficult to navigate. And certainly, Mr. Band and his team may have a difficult time on the ground really determining where the line is and whether someone has an alcoholic beverage over the line or next to the line or whatever. It's, there is a natural boundary there. There'll be a fence at the northern side and to the west and the south there is the, 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 uh, the walkway area. So I, I'd suggest that might just be an easier way to, to draw the line instead of having that squiggly line run around the area. Do, um, do they... Um do you, do you know or do you intend to do any kind of regular programming in that area? On the event lawn? On the event lawn. Certainly. Um, is, and, and, and is that the big uh, ellipsis at the very front? Yes. Yes, Commissioner. And, you know, the reason that we drew the line the way we did was to really encompass the areas where guests would go. Um, it would actually be our preference to kind of leave it because the rest of those areas are really landscaped and if we have a function that has alcohol we will um, have that area segregated mm -hmm. um, but we were trying to keep it so that it was really just the areas that fall under the criteria and not just include um, the other areas I do agree though the area back by the loading dock and all of that should be included it looks like a part of it and Todd, I think a part of it, it looks like, was cut off at the back end. Right. And I actually, I, I totally agree with Todd on that. You want to make sure you get the full loading dock in the area where, um, yeah, that should be included. And that looks like a miss on our part. But I think out by the event one, our preference would be to keep it to the areas that are going to be under regulation and where guests would go and not just the larger landscape areas. And that's, that's why they're delineated with those, uh, the event lawns. Those are the sort of the bulb outs off of the ellipse there or the south lawn. And commissioners, if you get an opportunity to see this, um, I would just say I was over at the property last week. It's not just landscape. It's heavily landscaped. So yep. delineation between what is a pathway and what is landscaping is dramatic. Yeah. Um, but it may be something that would be uh, helpful for the commission to see personally before making a decision. The same, actually, argument applies all the way down, um, I guess, that convention area. There's same arguments, uh, whether you want to keep the boundary just out to the walkway or you want to, I, I, I think it's all landscaped in there. That's, that's the same exact discussion. Right. We have a, there are event lawns that um, are on the east side 
um, of the convention space that sort of follow that same uh, pattern. And that's why we included them. And are really spill out from the convention spaces. So we can anticipate having an indoor outdoor event where uh, they may have a gathering at first on the event lawn outside and then move into the, uh, the room for, for the meetings. You've also included all of the harbor walk piece, right? So there's the, the other. The, the, harbor? the harbor walk is not included in the proposed oh. gaming establishment boundaries. Oh. That's open public space, and there's no alcohol allowed on the harbor walk. So that we can't include that, and nor uh, that would set off all kinds of other bells and whistles. And just to okay. clarify, I'm Commissioner just Zuniga. To these. The red line is the, the red thing. line. I was right. thinking it was the, the gray. Oh, no, no, no it's, it's the, the red, red line. line. Anything within right. the red line okay. is what we're proposing. The commission, in its last decision, explicitly determined that the harbor walk, uh, the internal roadways, surface uh, parking lots yes. are explicitly excluded yes. from the gaming establishment in that we don't have a specific regulatory interest and overseeing those areas, and the, the, do the dock area, I should add, um, in that they're governed under other laws of the Commonwealth, and there are other entities that oversee those areas. So those areas were out. Um, the ones we're talking about now were never specifically adjudicated. Uh, and the, uh, the only other area that I would add in that is included here that was never discussed in the past was the Port Cochet area, which makes sense to include and probably should have been in the first uh, map, but wasn't. So that's included here. So it is, it, it is contiguous. I guess uh, when I was first looking at only the, the gray, uh, it made no sense to me as to why we were including the ellipses and only the walkway. But looking at the red, all of that area is contiguous Correct. included. That's, that was why we, we um, suggested that. And would allow guests to traverse from one if one area to another, all within the boundaries. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. And again, I think this is one of the items we would additionally put out for public comment. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and all the floors above, right? In MGM, we have some exceptions because of the nature of the property. There is no exceptions when it comes to uh, We may work on that uh, at a later date. Um, there may be something in terms of delineation of the gaming floor. Okay. Yeah, I think we might take that up at a, at a later date. There is there's one item related to that. Okay. But for gaming establishment, it's all the floors. Correct. So no further questions on boundary. With respect to item 4B, trap draft Encore Boston Harbor alcohol permit. I, is Mr. Curtis here? Oh, there he is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Grossman. Good morning again, Mr. Curtis. How are you? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. <laughs> oh, it is afternoon. Thank you. Okay, today I'm joined with Bruce Band to present you with a draft of the gaming beverage app license a application for consideration and comment. Bill, is your mic on? It, it is. Get up a little closer. All right, okay, sorry closer. about that. Thank you. People always tell me I talk too loud, so. <laughs> the Division of Licensing and the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau, specifically the Gaming Agents Division, is not forwarding the application to the Commission with the recommendation, but rather wanted to provide the Commission with ample opportunity to consider the application given the unique nature of the 4 a.m. request. The application is substantially complete and contains requests for 23 alcohol licensed outlets. Of the 23 requested gaming beverage outlets, three of, the out three of these outlets will be leased to an outside party. The 23 outlets will be situated as follows. There'll be 15 on the ground floor, there'll be five outlets on the second floor, and there'll be three on the third floor. For the gaming floor, <coughs> excuse me, Encore Boston Harbor has requested alcohol service until 4 a.m. Um, would like to go through the, the slide deck right now, and I'd appreciate if like, Jackie Crumb could lead the way. Sure. <laughs> the Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so what we tried to do on the table of contents was um, 
items six through uh, 41 are areas, and they correspond with the pages, uh, are items where beverages would be uh, served. So we'll start with the draft beer liquor dispensing system and point of sales controls. Um, what we try to do is give a general outline of the process. So for draft beer, in any outlet with draft beers, the taps would be deployed no later than 2 a.m. We are actually going to have a last call at 1.30 a.m. And then with respect to the uh, gaming floor, if approved, uh, we would have a last call at 3.30 a.m. with the taps turned off at uh, 4 a.m. Uh, for the servicing of uh, alcohol in the gaming, on the gaming floor, if it's approved, uh, that would be for actively gaming guests only. And those would be not guests that are sitting next to someone who's actively gaming, but guests that are actively engaged and not just putting a dollar into the soft machine in order to get a drink. So that would be um, how servers would be trained with respect to that as well as our security team. On liquor dispensing systems, all buttons with alcoholic beverage functionality likewise would be automatically disabled no later than 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. with respect to the uh, casino floor. And this is configured by IT and the system administrators only and there's no override function on these outlets. Uh, same with the point of sale system, all buttons would be associated, associated with alcohol, alcoholic beverage distribution would be disabled at that 2 and 4 a.m. Uh, periods. On uh, liquor bottle service, these, for, for certain of the venues, um, as, as we go through the deck, I can point these out, but would only occur during private events. And for, with respect to any liquor bottle service, the bottle will, will remain in the possession of the server and will never, the server will never leave the table unattended uh, so that the bottle is available to guests. Uh, obviously, this doesn't apply to a bottle of wine, but uh, this is for all spirits. Uh, in different locations, the bottle is either physically removed or we do have someone who is standing there looking at the bottle the entire time. The guest will never be permitted to touch the bottle and serve themselves. In the lounges and nightclubs, same, uh, same setup in terms of the service. Uh, the only difference is we do intend to offer this not only for private events but for um, General, uh, general consumption. Uh, in in-room bottle service, just to be clear, a guest uh, will not be entitled to order a bottle of uh, spirits through in-room dining. However, if there's a private event within the room, uh, what we call sort of a hospitality event within the room, we would have a server follow the same protocols that I've outlined above where uh, they're the ones touching the bottle at all times. Uh, just to go through the ground level licensed areas, uh, this indicates the, uh, the gaming floor, the venues on the gaming floor. So we have the buffet, Fratelli, which is one of our least outlets, and uh, Santa Bar in the middle of the casino floor. And then going further along, this is outside the casino floor, we obviously have the meeting and convention space. And then we have, just going from um, direction wise, west <laughs> then south. We have Mystique, which is another leased outlet. This is one of the venues that we would, um, that's a leased outlet. Then we have Sinatra, which is our uh, formal Italian outlet. We have Rare, which is a steakhouse. Brew, which is grab and go, grab and go food. Uh, we have the Oyster Bar across from Sinatra's. And we have Red 8, which leads directly onto the gaming floor. There's access um, from Red 8 to the gaming floor. And then finally, we have Waterfront. So on Sinatra, this is uh, assorted mo modern and classic Italian cuisine. It's a very elegant restaurant and a bar neighboring the garden lobby. So there is outside pat patio seating available, but there's no access from the patio itself. The guests will have to go through the main entrance. On all of these, you'll see we proposed what we anticipate the hours of operation to be, but we are asking for extended uh, service periods in case there are private events or in case those hours are modified uh, to meet the demand of the facility. So for this uh, venue, 
with respect to bottle service, we would like to make it available, but only for private events. And all liquor and beer and wine will be locked in the venue, which is, has enclosed walls and a locked door. There's no draft beer in this venue. Turning to Mystique, this is a casual Asian fusion dining. It's Asian-inspired cuisine and sushi restaurant and bar adjoining the West Esplanade. This is going to be run by one of our local partners, Big Night Entertainment Group. Uh, again, we have proposed the normal hours of operation, but do ask for um, permissiveness in terms of serving alcohol with respect to private events uh, or a change in the times. Uh, the alcohol dispensing area, so all alcohol is distributed at the bar by the bartenders for guests sitting at the bar and from the bar by service to guests in the dining room. Again, only bottle service for private events only. Uh, likewise, this venue is completely enclosed and has locked doors and um, we will also post a security office in the Esplanade 24 hours a day. Our waterfront restaurant concept is shareable plates and snacks, craft beer and spirits. It's a casual dining restaurant adjoining the West Esplanade. Um, this would be for bottle service, it would be for private events only, and for alcohol dispensing, it's distributed at the bar by bartenders and from the bar by service to guests in the dining room. Again, all liquor, beer, and wine will be locked in the venue which has enclosed walls and a locked front door. Our oyster bar is our raw bar, which is casual dining adjoining the West Esplanade. And uh, again, alcohol is distributed by bartenders and served by service to guests in the dining room. Uh, bottle service for private events only. And this, uh, this will also, wine and beer will be locked behind the bar. The venue does not have a locked front door, so it'll be stanchioned off when it's closed and we will have a security officer outside the uh, outside in the Esplanade 24 hours a day. Red 8 is our Chinese casual dining concept adjacent to the casino floor. Uh, this does have extended hours where you'll see we, we're asking uh, for this to be open until 3. We, we intend for this to be open until 3 a.m., obviously realizing that alcohol service would stop prior to, uh, at 2 a.m., prior to the closing of the restaurant. Uh, the Alcohol will be distributed by bartenders and um, to those at the bar or by service to guests in the private dining room and bottle service again only for private events. Uh, there is no guest facing bar in this venue so everything will be served from back of the house and uh, the point of sale system as I explained before will be disabled at 2 a.m. The buffet is our all you can eat casual dining uh, also located right off the casino floor um, this one, uh, alcohol dispensing will be done by bartenders or by service to guests in the dining room. Again, private events only for bottle service. There's no guest facing bar in this venue, so it's all locked back of house and uh, point of sale uh, distribution systems are disabled uh, at 2 a.m. On Fratelli, this is another lease concept. It's Italian cuisine casual dining restaurant and a bar adjacent to the casino floor. Uh, for the alcohol, it will be distributed at the bar by bartenders and again by the servers to guests who are in the dining room. Uh, bottle service will be for private events only. Uh, the, all the taps will be deployed for draft towers and the point of sale system will be disabled at 2 a.m. Brew is our fa fast casual dining. It's adjacent, adjoining the East Esplanade. Uh, this will be open 24 hours a day, but obviously alcohol service will be limited to what is uh, to the 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. time range. The alcohol is dispensed by fountain workers at the counter, and everything will be deployed. Uh, it will be uh, removed at 2 a.m. We also intend to remove all alcoholic beverages from guest view at that 2 a.m. mark. Sorry, if we didn't have so many venues, this wouldn't be <laughs> quite so long. <laughs> um, the Rare Steakhouse, this is a classic steakhouse and bar. Very elegant restaurant and bar adjoining the East Esplanade. There is also outside patio seating available. Again, no entrance from the outside. The guests must enter through the uh, main entrance. 
Uh, we intend for this to be open, bar would open at four, and then it would go from five to 10. Again, we'd like, uh, we'd like to have flexibility on those hours for private events or if schedule demands. So the alcohol disp is dispensed by bartenders for guests at the bar, and again, uh, servers to guests in the dining room or on the patio, uh, bottle service for private events only. This restaurant also has enclosed walls and a locked front door. Our center bar is right in the middle of the gaming floor, and this would also serve to provide complimentary beverages for actively gaming guests from the 2 to 4 a.m. Uh, time period. So we would propose uh, operating this 24 hours a day subject to the limitations of the alcohol license with respect to alcohol service. Um, for actively gaming guests, they would be served at their gaming uh, location, and those will be delivered by servers. Um, if cash paying guests come up, they will not be entitled to purchase alcoholic beverages after the 4 a.m. cutoff. However, they would be able to purchase uh, non-alcoholic beverages at that time. Uh, given that this will be serviced uh, 24 hours a day, um, the alcohol would still be uh, the alcohol would still be available, but the uh, ability to order it would be cut off at the 4 a.m. mark or at the 2 a.m. mark. So this just goes into our complimentary policy. I think I've touched on a lot of these, but uh, complimentary beverages would not exceed $25 in value. Uh, if they do, they would have to be approved by a slot supervisor or above prior to serving them. And then also guests may only receive one complimentary beverage for every 20 minutes of active gaming. And the way that we have thought about how this works is our um, our, sh our shifts or, or the way that the servers, uh, the areas that they have to cover, they physically will not, would not have the capacity to go back to a guest more than once every 20 minutes. So our VIP registration desk and uh, lounge that um, would be open 24 hours a day, again, subject to the limitations of the alcohol service. There would be no bottle service there, and everything will be in back of house storage. Just to be clear, I know this goes without saying, obviously everything is subject to 24 hour a day, seven days a week surveillance. Our ret retail stores, um, this wine and champagne only, and we would intend for this to be distributed by supervisors and managers, all from back of house locked storage. Meeting and convention space, uh, also distributed by bartenders and served by service to guests in the dining room, bottle service for private, event, private events only. So the, the service is through portable bars, which um, will never be unattended, and they're broken down at the conclusion of an event and all liquor, beer, and wine would be locked up uh, back of the house when not in use. So on the Harbor Walk, this is the area that we were just looking at. So it's really the event lawn. We're calling it the Harbor Walk, but it's, it's really the event lawn and the gazebo that extends out there. Uh, this would be for private events only, and um, we would, again, serve through portable carts that are never left unattended. Uh, these carts will have camera coverage and all liquor and beer would be returned to the back of house when they are not in service. We'll also have security stationed uh, around on all these events to make sure that, um, that the alcohol is not leaving and going onto the harbor walk. So I think we touched on this next slide, which is the casino beverage service. Uh, what the next slides do is they point out essentially where our back of house bars are that would be used for servicing the casino floor. The next two. There's a whole bunch of those. We, we have a lot of back of house facilities. <laughs> So this just goes into a little bit more of the process. So as I said before, when the cocktail service makes its round on the casino floor, they would take non-alcoholic and alcoholic beverage orders. Uh, they go to a designated service bar, they swipe their assigned MyCross system card and verbalize the drink order to the bartender. 
the bartender rings in the orders and produces the alcoholic beverages, but the server provides the uh, non-alcoholic beverages. So the cocktail server then retrieves the alcoholic beverage from the bartender and delivers it to the guest who is actively gaming. If the guest is no longer actively gaming by the time the server comes back, the guest would not be the server would not be permitted to provide that alcoholic beverage to the guest. Jackie, uh, can I ask a question? Maybe Bruce or Bill or um, Ed can remind me. I remember from MGM there's a 3:30 a.m. Uh, milestone, if you will. Last call. Last, Last call, call um, in which also the, um, to, give, to give enough time for people to finish their last drink, I suppose. Uh, but uh, that also enables, or disables rather, the, um, the machines at, at that time. Is that, is that what happens at MGM? Yeah, usually, yes. Okay. Because some, some of the verbiage here, um, you, you are... Yeah. So suggesting uh, our that thought on that is to do a last call and let people know, you know, this is your last chance to order. So we would, we would deliver the, we would propose delivering the drink in that 3.30 to 4 a.m. range, but that would be the final drink that they can have. So if they order, you know, at, if, if it's at 3.35, that drink would still be uh, delivered to the patron. Okay. Um, there's also... The final drink, I should say. Yeah, there was also um, some kind of control around um, cup. Uh, there, there are different cups to uh, differentiate. Is that yeah? We something? we had a discussion about this, and the idea is, once a person stops gaming and starts wandering around the casino floor, we would ask them to, uh, you know, to to finish their drink if they're no longer actively gaming or remove the drink. We didn't really see the need for distinguishing with the cups, because. Um, Everyone at 2 a.m. is either done, they're not going to get refilled. They're either done and they're getting a new drink because they're actively gaming, or I, I guess we just didn't see the purpose of changing out the glassware at that okay. point. Well, at least some of it, my recollection at least in MGM had to do at times with the plaza, but there was also the notion of the closing of, of the, 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 the expiration of the time. Is that, am I getting those, that um, recollection mixed um, up? trying to remember a whole yeah. eight months back. Um, I think initially there was some um, designation they had anticipated using glassware until 2 a.m. and then shifting to a frosted um, plastic cup. Mm -hmm. um, it, it turns out I think they went, they ended up after a week or so going right to plastic. I think it was a different type of plastic. I think the only delineation was it um, was a distinction to the servers who was uh, supposed to be actively gaming because they are now drinking between two to four with this special uh, mm -hmm. frosted, yeah. and I, frosted I, glass. I, mm. I think our concern was if at, let's say, 3 a.m., someone has an actively gaming glass, when that server comes around again, if that person's no longer actively gaming, they don't they don't get another drink no matter what. So it's not, you know, just because you were actively gaming 30 minutes ago does not mean that you are still actively gaming 30 minutes later. Um, so I, We're worried that the glassware is actually going to impede the proper oversight of this. And we think it's better to either you are gaming or you are not gaming. And, uh, and again, the whole issue about last call, and then ultimately turn the taps off. Uh, but the glassware, we couldn't think of a scenario where the glassware makes it any safer. Um, and matter of fact, it seemed more confusing to all our be beverage folks. And so, and again, I think MGM abandoned it after. I they, think. they still utilize they, it and stuff, but I think their purpose is more for people don't leave with the glassware or. You know, you know. I think the other distinction, maybe, frankly, MGM is self serving. Uh, systems where people can yeah. get um, non-alcoholic beverages. And we don't have we any, don't have there's no self-service on our floor, uh, so we didn't, we just couldn't find a reason why this would be helpful okay. in the argument. Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead to the uh, second level licensed areas. So we have our garden cafe, which is seasonally driven and locally inspired casual dining. It's on the mezzanine of the garden lobby. Um, 
this again is only distributed by bartenders or servers. Bottle service would be for private events only. There's no guest facing bar in this uh, facility, so everything is behind the service bar and um, would be locked up. In room dining, um, again, distributed by bartenders uh, who then deliver to a server who delivers it to the guests in the room. Uh, as discussed before, only um, bottle service for private or hospitality events held in those rooms where there'd be a, a server constantly in the room. Uh, no guest facing bars in the rooms, so everything would be brought to the room and then taken back of house and locked up. Garden Lounge is a upscale craft cocktail lounge located on the mezzanine of the garden lobby. Uh, drinks would be distributed by bartenders or by services to guests in the seating area. We, do, we, we would like to be able to do bottle service in this facility, again, um, only in the manner that I previously described. And this facility, um, the only access to the bar is through back of house, and so would, this would be locked off. Uh, uh, sorry, this would be stanchioned off when it's closed, but the alcohol would be locked up back of house. So Memoir is our least outlet, which is an ultra lounge. It's a elevated boutique nightclub, which is located in the upper east of the mezzanine. And uh, this one, we would like to serve bottle service as part of regular course. And um, it's a completely enclosed venue that would be locked um, when it's not in use. The On Deck Burger Bar is an American sports bar. It's casual dining on the Upper East Mezzanine. Um, uh, alcohol would be served by bartenders or to servers if they are dining. And bottle service, uh, I don't know why we have two yeses. Maybe we feel emphatic about bottle <laughs> service for private <laughs> events here. But um, bottle service would be for private uh, events only. And this is, um, the only access to the bar is through back of house. This venue does not have locked doors, so we would have to remove all the alcohol and put it back in the house. And then on the third floor, we have our salon, which uh, we would just like to be able to serve wine and champagne uh, by managers and supervisors, no bottle service, and everything would be locked up back of house. Same with the spa. And then I think we talked about the boardroom. It's up on the third floor where the yeah. spa is. Yeah. But same uh, process yeah. uh, for, uh, same as the other meeting, banquets, and convention events that we discussed. And the last few slides just show you where the product would be stored, and as well as our pump room. And these are back of house, obviously. Open for questions. You obviously have a, a couple of leased operators, and they'll chime in. How are they guided in the provision of an alcohol license? Is that on Encore, or is that on you working independently with the individual leased space um, operators? We work with Encore in conjunction with the, uh, the lessees. And, and Commissioner, if you see in those particular um, slides, there's uh, something we call the jointly responsible person, which is from the lessee. Okay. And they understand that they're subject to the same regulations and controls that, that apply to us. Okay. Their employees have been instructed uh, that they need to register. Certain individuals will need to register the bartenders, the managers, um, the lounge service. So these folks, they know they have to go through our process. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask the public comment period for the two to four for MGM? How long did we put that request out for public comment? Two weeks. Two weeks. We did. Okay. And we also have our police of chief here, Chief Maisie from the city of Everett. If there's any questions for him, I'd like. And to Lieutenant to Strong. Ahead. So I would suggest we uh, coincide for all three items for a two-week comment period. And then we'll figure out uh, whether the meeting, how the meeting coincides with that two-week comment period. Sounds good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
We're moving to item five. Fellow commissioners, do you have any updates? Uh, I do have two updates, and this is, relates to the decision that the commission issued on April 30th uh, regarding wind suitability. Uh, we issued uh, uh, both fines and conditions, and we just want to clarify the date certain that we have determined for the fine date to be due. Legal has advised that under our statute and regulations would be May 31st. Of course, we welcome any any uh, discussion on that if you view it differently, but that's based on our regulation. So that would be the date certain. I also want to note that uh, pursuant to uh, another condition, we have convened um, a procurement management team to begin the selection process for the independent monitor, the work that we anticipate pursuant to our, our decision. That's it. Well, and, and just on that note, um, we've not heard from um, the company on, this, uh, on these other matters, um, uh, and they have until the date certain that, that the chair mentioned to either comply or appeal our prior decision, is that correct? Yeah, so yeah, in fairness, we've heard from the company that they have an internal process to go through um, and they anticipate going through that uh, relatively quickly. Okay. So. Is there any further discussion? Do I have a motion? So moved. I second. And that would be a motion for adjournment? Yes. It would be. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed, 5-0. Thank you very much.